following is a sermon preached at Grace Church of Orange, California. Join us now as we go verse by verse through God's inspired, inerrant, infallible Word. So please open your Bibles to Romans chapter 14, and we're focusing today on the Lordship of Christ. Last week we looked at Romans 14 verses 1 through 12, and we saw why we should not wrongly judge others in Christ. And it's because every believer is accepted by God, every believer is under the lordship of Christ, and every believer will be judged by God. So because of that, uh, you know, I was there Sunday night at my home group, and Tom Radmilovich was teaching, I was listening, the group was discussing, and God was just breaking my heart once again over this passage of scripture, and the idea of the lordship of Christ, and really humbling me with regard to this scripture. And so I want us to go back to verses 10 through 12 in Romans 14. That's what we're gonna be today. And I want you to see what really, what I was seeing last Sunday night, which is the lordship of Christ and what it signifies, also what it demands, and also what it delights in. And so the idea is that we uh, we'll consider today the Lordship of Christ, and I want you to know uh, more about the Lordship of Christ today, but not just know about it, but actually live in light of the Lordship of Christ in such a way that God would be glorified. And so please stand with me if you're able. I'm going to read these three verses of Scripture. We're really going to drop anchor on these three verses of Scripture today and see God on the throne, the Lordship of Christ. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? Well, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me and every tongue will confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. And Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the privilege of being here together today. I pray, Lord, that you would impress your lordship upon our hearts in such a way that we would glorify you. Let me pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The big idea here is really that we glorify God by living under Christ's lordship. And it's easy for Christians to say that. It's easy for someone to say, well, I'm a believer and and I believe that Jesus is Lord, but you might be using the term Lord in a way that really doesn't line up with what the Bible says about the Lordship of Christ. And so we're going to see that today. I know that we all struggle with Lordship. We don't like someone being in authority over us. And so we don't like that so much. And so it's kind of hard for us sometimes to really grasp what it means for Jesus to be Lord. It's absolutely essential, though, for every believer to acknowledge the lordship of Christ. Without the lordship of Christ, there is no life for us. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord, and he rules with authority. We're talking today about the lordship of Christ, and since the earliest days of the church, this has been the the clarion call of the church. Believers have confessed Christ's lordship. The first confession of the church was the simple declaration, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And many Christians lost their lives for that phrase. For saying and declaring and living by the truth that Jesus is Lord, many Christians have been killed. So it's important. Believers living under Roman rule were killed for confessing Christ and refusing to say Caesar is Lord. Not surprisingly, the Apostles' Creed, the earliest of creeds, confesses Jesus as Lord. So I want you to see with me today, as we look at the Lordship of Christ, what it signifies, what it demands, and what it delights in. The first thing that it signifies, this is what we're going to see first, it signifies sovereign authority. The sovereign authority of God. That's what Lordship signifies. Verse 10 starts this way. We will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Actually, it ends that way. Excuse me. Uh, Why do you pass judgment on your brother? If you're doing that, you're wrong. And why do you despise your brother? If you're doing that, you're wrong. And here's the reason, because we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of God. So we're going to all stand before the judgment seat of God. We're going to stand before the judge who will decide our fate. 
It's a very weighty matter. And I want you to notice how prominent Lord is in the first 12 verses of Romans 14, especially verses 4 to 9. Nine times you see Lord, and it's important. It first shows up in verse 4. The Lord is able to make him stand. And then, whoever observes the day does so in honor of the Lord. Whoever eats, eats in honor of the Lord. Whoever abstains does so in honor of the Lord. And then it says in verse 8, if we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. It says that whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. This is a believer. You belong to Christ. You are the Lord's either way. And then verse 9, to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. He is Lord. Uh, You see the, the term Lord 39 times in Romans. Lord means ruler. It means authority. It means master. Maybe a word that we could grasp is boss. Lordship of Christ signifies his sovereignty as our savior and his absolute right to rule over us. There's no wiggle room on this. Uh, You don't get a, a choice on this one. This is the way it is. And we know what happens when we are left to ourselves. We just run amok, right? We make a mess of things. We ruin things. We we reach for our own glory. But the Bible clearly says that there is one Lord. Only one Lord. 1 Corinthians 8, 6, it talks about how there are many so-called gods in heaven and on earth. And indeed, many, quote, gods and many, quote, lords. And then it says this, yet for us, for believers, there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist. And one Lord... Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, he created the world, and through whom we exist. We exist through Christ the Lord. He is our authority. There is one true Lord. There aren't many lords. There is one true Lord. It's an abject fact. It's undisputed. It's often denied. It's often challenged, but it is immovable. It's like there's one sun, there's one earth, there's only one version of you, You know, even if you get cloned, I'm sorry, but it's really not you. But there is only one Lord. One Lord. In the New Testament, you see the word Lord, and you look up the Greek word, and it's kurios. That's the word translated Lord. The title used of Jesus in the highest possible way. Some people would use the term like sir in a very polite way. But when it's used of Jesus, it signifies that he is almighty God. It's used in the highest way of Jesus. You look in the Bible and you see the names for God, and the most common name for God is God. In the Old Testament, the translation of the Hebrew word Elohim. One of the titles for God in the Old Testament is Lord. It's a translation of Adonai. And then there's a name that God has given himself as his special proper name. Four letters. We say Yahweh. Jews would not even pronounce the name because they knew it was such a weighty name. They knew it was such a a crucial, important name. They wouldn't even utter it out loud. And it was because they held God in such reverence. We will throw the term Lord around and we'll just read it in the Bible and say, Oh, Lord Jesus Christ, that, that comes before Jesus which comes before Christ, and not even think about what that word means when applied to Jesus. In the Greek version of the Old Testament, it's called the Septuagint. We translate the Hebrew Yahweh and Adonai as kurios, Lord. So here's Yahweh, the revealed name of God in Hebrew, and Adonai, one of his titles. And and the translators of of the Old Testament from, from the Hebrew into the Greek, where they made the Septuagint, they used kurios, Lord. They used the, the most important title for God in the Septuagint, which is quoted in the New Testament, is Lord. That's how important it is. When kurios is used of Jesus, it conveys the idea of the one who is absolutely sovereign. It is an absolutely majestic title. It's not just something to throw around. It conveys God's sovereignty. It conveys his divine power. And do you notice something here? It has nothing to do with us. You know, we think a lot about ourselves, don't we? We talk a lot about ourselves. We're always thinking about ourselves. Lord helps you think about God. Helps you fix your mind on who he is. The word Lord as applied to Jesus is proof of his divinity. 
in Philippians 2 regarding his humiliation and exaltation. The humiliation and exaltation of God the Son, it calls Jesus Lord in the highest sense possible. Lord is the name above all names given to Jesus when the Father exalts him. Here is God the Son in perfect obedience, going to the cross, dying for sin in our place, and then his resurrection, his glorious resurrection, clearly revealing that Jesus is worthy to be Lord of all. This is why the apostles pronounced it so strongly. Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Acts 2.36, Peter says on the day of Pentecost, God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Lord is the, is the most important title for Jesus. Lord signifies deep worship and sincere reverence for God. Romans tells us Jesus is Lord over and over again. In Romans chapters 1 through 11, you get set on such a solid foundation that the gospel is the power of God for salvation. That your justification as a believer, your glorification, even your sanctification as you as you Make choices in your life, wanting to be sanctified, and God is sanctifying you. This is like Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you to will and do his good pleasure. But you know that all of it is a gracious gift from God to his chosen people, who he bought with the precious blood of Christ the Lord. And so a Christian can know the gospel, believe the gospel, rejoice in the gospel, celebrate the gospel, live the gospel, proclaim the gospel, because Jesus is Lord. This is why. As a believer, you've been adopted, you were grafted into the body of Christ. You have acceptance, you have forgiveness. Christ died for you, his enemy, justified the guilty, freed you from slavery, freed you from bondage to sin. You were hopelessly condemned, now you're gloriously uncondemned. You had no way out, and now you are following the way and the truth and the life. You have credited righteousness into your account. Your account was filled up by God. You were redeemed. You were bought with a price, all because of the lordship of Christ. And so it is so costly. All we can say is glory to Christ, our Lord and King. Glory to Christ, our Lord and King. Think of the lordship of Christ. It should overwhelm your soul. If you think of the lordship of Christ, you can see that it looks forward to your glorification, but it looks backward to your justification. You were chosen before the foundation of the world by the Lord of all. There was a purpose in all of it. God didn't just make lordship up yesterday to help you today. It's eternally true. The lordship of Christ is eternally true. Lord is not something you make Jesus. A lot of Christians will say this. I want to make Jesus Lord of my life. You don't make him Lord. He is Lord. You acknowledge his lordship. You don't make him Lord. God made him Lord. You don't make him Lord. He is Lord. You recognize it, and you respond accordingly. You see, lordship, it solves your who should I listen to quandary. Lordship solves your authority issues. You have an issue with authority? You need to fall under the lordship of Christ in obedience, in alignment, Lordship is not a democracy. You don't get a vote. God is in control. We are not. There are a lot of people who will just willfully do their own thing, right? And they think, well, God is going to abide by my feelings. A lot of believers will act like this. They'll say, I'm going to do whatever I want because God's going to move with me. There are unbelievers that have a better understanding of the lordship of Christ than, than believers do at times. I heard of a man recently that heard the gospel and said, wow, That means that I would not be in control anymore. But many willfully will do their own thing, and God will not move to fit you. We're to be doers of his word. His word is objective. His word is authoritative. It has an unchanging meaning. It has unchanging authority. It's not a cloud that hovers over you. A lot of people think of the Bible which is under the lordship of Christ because it is the word of God. And and they think that the Bible is just going to move like a cloud according to every wind and wave of doctrine that they think they should go with. It's not a cloud that hovers over you that changes with your changing thoughts and opinions. 
A lot of people are tossed to and fro with every wind and wave of doctrine because they haven't got the lordship of Christ settled in their heart. Because if Christ is Lord, his word is true. But we have so much concern for ourselves, right? I mean, we always want to be first in line. When you're in line, just think about being in line. The most simple of human things. There's a queue, as some people call it somewhere else. Uh, there's a line, and you, you're we're way back in line. And you're thinking to yourself, why did those people get in front of me? What right did they have? Oh, wait, I see a friend at the front of the line. Oh, they were saving me a spot. It's okay, they were saving me a spot. It's my friend, because we want to be first. We have trouble with lordship, don't we? We have trouble with authority, don't we? But lordship, the lordship of of Christ stops you in your tracks. It it presses pause on your agenda. It literally does. Because Jesus is in first place. Jesus is preeminent, always. It's not like, well, for now, for a couple hours, Jesus will be in first place. He's always in first place. He's always preeminent. He's always Lord. Now, you may acknowledge that or not, but he is always Lord. He stops the traffic. Jesus stops the traffic. Everyone must yield. Think about this. When you're in traffic, and have you ever been in a place where all of a sudden everything just stopped and you had to just stay where you were because somebody really important was coming by? This happened to me recently. I took Angela down to San Diego for her birthday, and it just so happened at the very moment that we were going to take our bikes uh, down on the very road that our hotel was on, all of a sudden, our bikes, all the cars, all the people had to stop. Everything was barricaded. There was a huge motorcade coming by, and, and it was a very important motorcade, and so we all had to stop. We were frozen in our tracks. We were watching. Everyone was videotaping. It was the presidential motorcade. They were like... 30 policemen on motorcycles. There were dozens of of really heavily armored vehicles. They were going fast. We had to stop. They were going first. We had to yield. Now you think about it in such a much bigger way that Jesus being Lord stops you in your tracks and causes you to yield to him and you yield to his word. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That should settle it for us. But his position is questioned and challenged at every turn. It is often seen as optional by many who profess faith in him. But it is an unchanging fact. This is the first thing that really strikes us when we really think deeply of the lordship of Christ. It signifies sovereign authority. He is Lord. And I think that's the first thing that God wants us to get settled down into our hearts. Jesus is Lord of all. Now there's a second thing. We'll move on to verse 11. Something that Lordship demands. Something that Lordship asks of you and and really you don't have a a choice if you want to, to be right with God. Lordship demands worshipful acknowledgement. Look at verse 11. It says, for it is written... So we're in Romans 14, 11, and is now going to quote the Old Testament, Isaiah 45, 23, as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. This is the way it's going to be. They will confess, they will acknowledge, they will give praise, they will bow and confess, and, and it indicates submission to an acknowledgement of lordship. Now, you know, in Philippians 2, it says the same thing, it quotes the same verse, And you know that everyone isn't bowing before Jesus right now, and everyone isn't confessing Christ as Lord right now. And so if someone dies and and goes to hell and doesn't have Jesus, there will be a day that they will confess, that they will acknowledge, that they will bow, but they will never be saved. See, we must acknowledge him as Lord now. Admit it, accept it, bow the knee in worship to Jesus. This is the biblical model, folks. This is it. And you see it all the way through the Bible. Even the idea of bowing the knee. You know, when when Joseph was in Egypt and he became a ruler in Egypt, people came and bowed the knee before him. It showed subservience. It showed that he was in control of them. Even his very brothers did that. 
In 1 Kings 18, God said, I have 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. It's cross-referenced into Romans 11 even. The Bible shows bowing the knee to God as acknowledging his lordship. Solomon, when he gave his prayer of dedication for the temple, got on his knees. He spread his hands out to heaven. He was acknowledging that God is Lord over him, that God is in supreme authority over him. Ezra, in Ezra 9, he fell on his knees in worship to God. In Romans 14, right here, he's quoting Isaiah 45. As you get the link to Philippians 2. Paul is applying this to Jesus. Every knee will bow to him. Every tongue confess that he is Lord. In Psalm 2, the kings of the earth will kiss the sun. It implies bowing the knee to do so. Bowing the knee is promising allegiance to lordship. The emphasis here is that. The lordship of Christ, it signifies authority, but it demands worship. It demands worship. A lot of modern worship today generates an emotional output. It's very short-sighted and very stunted. A lot of people give the impression it's about me and Jesus having a party, having an emotion party. Now, if your emotions are disconnected from from your singing and your worship of God, something's probably wrong. You can't just do that and not feel it and think it, okay? So your emotions are involved. But it is this. You're rejoicing in Christ. You're rejoicing in his goodness. You're joyful in the Lord in all of your life so that when you come into a gathering of believers, you can pour out your heart together with other believers as you sing the praises of Christ the Lord. You, you're saying, we owe him highest allegiance. So we're gonna sing to him. We're gonna pray to him. We're gonna hear his word. And we're gonna do so saying, he's in control. We're not calling the shots. He is Lord. He bought us. That's why we call him Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul uses a metaphor that was common in ancient slavery. He says, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Glorify God as you live this life. Why? Because you're not your own. Someone else owns you. You have a Lord. Christians, you have a Lord. You were bought with a price. In the first century slave markets, a, a slave was bought and sold and purchased under full authority of the one who bought him. Well, Jesus purchased every believer from our old master's sin. Now he's our master. He has full authority over us. He owns us. He purchased us with his blood, his precious blood. He gave his life for us. The judgment was taken by him. Lordship is settled. For a Christian, there should not be any question about it. Lordship doesn't budge. It doesn't budge. There's no wiggle room. There's no, there's no you know, crack where you can get through and slip out from under the Lordship of Christ. In Isaiah 26, verses 3 and 4, it says, The steadfast of mind, God will keep in perfect peace. It says that we should... Trust in the Lord forever, because in God the Lord we have an everlasting rock, immovable, authoritative. We know people who don't know Christ and don't acknowledge Christ. There are unsafe people who live by their own rules. But there are some professing believers who live by their own rules, with no thought of God, functional atheism basically, and they're going against God's word. A Christian is supposed to live by what God has revealed and repent if they don't. In Romans 10, 9, it says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Someone will say, how do I get saved? How am I saved? Well, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You have to understand what faith is, or you may think you have it when you don't. True faith is obedient and repentant. Only by turning from sin do we rest on Christ alone for salvation. You don't say, I'm going to believe in Jesus and bring my sins with me. In Joel chapter 2, confession is linked to repentance. Rend your hearts, not your garments. Whenever Israel expressed the desire to uh, get right with God, it always began with personal and corporate repentance, turning from sin. Psalm 51, 19 says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, 
A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. So when you're humble before God and you're confessing and repenting, then lordship solves your humility issues. Lordship solves your pride issue. Pride fades in the presence of Christ. We're too big in our own eyes. Even the most insecure amongst us are too big in our own eyes. You think with sober judgment, Romans 12, 3, when the lordship of Christ humbles you. The lordship of Christ humbles us. Where we would say, I consider myself the least of sinners. Where we would say, I consider myself lower than others. And that, that God is most high, that, that Jesus is most high. And, and therefore, I won't force, force my opinion. I won't force my agenda. I won't blame God when things happen in my life. I'm going to seek unity in the body of Christ. I'm going to build other Christians up. I'm going to praise God. I'm going to acknowledge the lordship of Christ and deny myself. Some people go, ooh, that's negative. You're going to deny yourself? That's exactly what Jesus said to do. In Matthew 16, 24, he told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, you want to be my follower? Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Lordship demands acknowledging worship. I don't know where your heart is at today. Only God knows. But if you don't know Jesus Christ, the Lord, you need him. You need to believe in him. You need to repent of your sins. You need to come to Christ. You need to say, wow, Jesus died for me in my place. His great love sent him to the cross. He was buried. He rose on the third day. He is exalted to the right hand of the Father. He is coming back for all who acknowledge his lordship. I want to repent and believe. If that's you today, do that now. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. See, lordship gives you hope. It gives you hope. You're you're struggling with your life. You've got so many pieces that seem to not fit in the puzzle and you woke up this morning just frazzled in your heart and mind because you just can't work it out how many of you are like that how many of you were waking up like me this morning when you said i just can't figure all of this out and then you were reminded as a believer in jesus wait a minute Jesus is Lord. Jesus is in control. Oh, wait a minute. Jesus is with me. I'm not alone. I'm secure. I'm not forsaken. I'm accepted. Lordship gives you hope. In Christ the Lord, you have stability. Amidst a lot of instability. You have a resiliency. Uh, unchanging sovereignty. God provides you new life. He provides you with a new beginning. Uh, Again and again and again. He provides you security when all is coming undone. See, Christ the King, Christ the Lord, never loses control of his kingdom. He's not thrown off balance. He's not knocked off his heels by the latest emergency or the latest trend or the latest fad. He is always Lord. He is always in control. And he's never broken. The world is broken. We're broken. We do broken things. We have broken relationships. And Christ's lordship gives you hope. It gives you hope. You mourn over your sin. You mourn over other people's sin. You mourn over people's unbelief. You mourn over your issues in life. You, you grieve over dishonesty. You, you lament. You, you live under the, the shadow of sin and the sentence of death. And the Lord comforts his people. The Lord comforts his people because he can, because he's Lord. And guess who gets first attention? From the Lord the humble, repentant heart. Isaiah 66, 1 and 2, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool, but this is the one to whom I will look. I'm the king of all, I'm over everything, and here's who I will will look to to help. 
He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. That our hearts would be humble, that we would be even contrite of our own sins, and that we would say the word of God is my ruler. It's, it cuts everything straight because Jesus rules over me. I love you, dear brothers and sisters. I really do. And I'm praying for you because we are, we, aren't we not dealing with sin's effects every day? Aren't we? We're just dealing with the, the outcropping of sin. We're dealing with even the misery that sin brings. But the Lord is merciful. So he alleviates the misery that sin brings upon us. Blessed be the Lord, the psalmist said, who daily bears our burden. He bears your burden. Sin harasses you. Jesus bears your burden. His righteousness reigns through the gospel. God is working all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So what do we do? We, we bow before him. We, we confess. We admit that he is Lord. We, we do so all the while knowing that all around us, people are saying that, that the cross and the message of the gospel is foolishness, that what we are doing right now is foolishness. And, and we believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we confess that to the glory of God the Father. You know, Christ's lordship seems optional to a lot of people. But they're deceiving themselves. The lordship of Christ signifies sovereign authority, and it demands worshipful acknowledgement with no wiggle room. In Revelation chapter 5, you've got this picture seen in heaven. It's beautiful. If you want to go there with me. <laughs> if you want to go there with me. If you want to go to heaven with me, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. And if you want to go over to Revelation 5 with me right now, I'm going to read some verses. Verse 11, I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne, that's the Lord, the Lord sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. We're going to do it at the end of time and throughout eternity. So what should we do today? What do you want to do tomorrow? How about right now as we live? This leads us to the third point today. Verse 12. The idea that the, that the lordship of Christ delights in yield, yielded obedience. Jesus delights in yielded obedience of his people. Look at verse 12. It just says this. So then... Each one of us will give an account of himself to God. What does that mean? It means that we're going to stand before God and make a statement. We're going to make a statement. We're going to stand before God, who, the judge, who is going to decide our fate, and we're going to make a statement. Every Christian, 2 Corinthians 5.10 tells us this, we're all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. And it doesn't take a, a brain surgeon or a genius to figure this one out. You want to do good, not evil. And so on that day, you want to be able to answer to the Lord that, that you've done what is good in his sight, in his strength and for his glory. You're going to give an account to God. You're going to give an answer. Christ's lordship is a fact, and you must acknowledge it in worship and answer it with obedience. Lordship demands an obedient answer. The tongue confesses. Worship must lead to obedience, or it isn't worship. God delights in your obedience. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22, this is what Saul heard as a result of his disobedience. Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice to heed than the fat of rams. Here is Saul, disobedient to God, protesting his innocence, contradicting himself, shifting the blame. Does that sound familiar to anyone? And he claims to have wiped out the Amalekites even though he spared their king. Like, you've got to be kidding me. And God says, I don't take as much delight in your sacrifice now. I want your obedience. 
heartfelt submission to what I deem pleases me most. To obey is better. God says rebellion and, and disobedience, that ranks up there with the worst of sins. That's up there with idolatry. Every sin that you and I commit, in that moment, it is a rejection of the lordship of Christ. You can do all the good work you want. You could say, wow, what I'm doing is really good, and not do it from a heart of worship to God, not worshiping God obediently, it's nothing. God sees the heart. If you call Christ Lord, you must do what he says. This is what Jesus says. In John 3, 36, it says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. God's wrath remains on him. Hebrews 5, 9 says that Jesus became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. You must respond to the acknowledgement of Christ's lordship with yielded obedience. That's true worship in all of life. It's where your tongue is confessing and your, your mind is, is agreeing and, and your feet and your hands and all your decisions are, are going in a way that pleases God. You know, the evidence of agreeing with the, the lordship of Christ is in the life of a believer is where you have a hunger to know and do the word of God. When the word speaks, God speaks. And so Luke 6 Jesus is talking about builders and foundations. And Jesus asks this question. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and acts on them, he is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when a flood occurred, the torrent burst against that house and could not shake it because it had been very well built. It is wise to heed the word of God. Tongue confessing praise to God as an act of worship signifies obedience to the word of God, a declaration that you're going to align yourself with the word of God. In 1978, a bunch of pastors and, and biblical scholars got together and they said, you know, we see there's a lot of believers that are not going with the word of God. And so they came up with a Chicago statement on biblical inerrancy. One of the, one of the paragraphs says this. Holy Scripture, being God's own word, written by men, prepared and superintended by his spirit, is of infallible divine authority in all matters upon which it touches. It is to be believed as God's instruction in all that it affirms, obeyed as God's command in all that it requires, embraced as God's pledge in all that it promises. I think that's a really good way to approach the word of God. I'm going to believe it, I'm going to obey it, and I'm going to embrace it. If you bow down before the throne of God, it calls for your active obedience to the word of God. Your, your true faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ. So you have to believe who he says he is in his word. You place your faith in, in Christ alone for salvation, that means you believe that he will keep all of his promises. You have to submit to Jesus as Lord to be saved. And then your continued obedience shows that you're saved. Your, your works do not justify you. They show that you've been justified by faith. Obeying Christ as Lord is part of true faith. Your, your works of obedience don't justify you. They don't save you. But if there are no works of obedience, which the first is believing in Jesus as he commands you to, then you don't have the faith that saves. The fruit proves the root. If your life in no way reflects the lordship of Christ, you're not saved. Confess trust in Christ alone as Savior. Submit to him as Lord. Look for ways today to obey him. I mean, think about it. How, how does, ask yourself the question, how does the lordship of Christ affect my life? How does it actually affect my life? My reactions, my thoughts, my words, my deeds. In Psalm 40, I, I read part of Psalm 40 at the beginning of the service today. In Psalm 40, verse 6, it says this, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. My ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you did not require. In this Psalm, David is praising God for his faithfulness and, and delivering his people from catastrophe. God's mighty power, control over the world, control over his own life. And David is praising God. God, the Lord, focusing on God's faithfulness. And God is saying sincere worship, not just outward 
ceremonies, but the heart of yielded obedience is what I want. This is just like David. This is how believers should, should approach it today. Yield yourself completely to God. He delights in, in the one who sincerely devoted to him in obedience. A person may say they're a Christian. They may go to church. They may attend Bible study, read their Bible. But if, you're, if your life is unholy, your worship is insincere. It's, it's fake. Yielded obedience isn't just God's delight. It should be our delight. David in Psalm 40, verse 8 says, I delight to do your will, O my God. Willing to yield his life to God. The driver then would not be his own desires. The word of God engraved upon his heart. The work of the Spirit of God. Hebrews 10 says that this psalm, Psalm 40, prophesies of Christ's work. That that he obeyed by going to the cross He fulfilled all the outward ceremonies, all the outward sacrifices, fully accomplished God's will and yielded obedience. And here's our life, affected by sin on a daily basis. If you're a believer, you will stand before God Almighty, clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Hope. The Lordship gives us hope. Christ perfectly obeyed the law. So we live by faith. We we fix our eyes on Christ in in whom we have the strength to do God's will and delight in him. What might it look like for you and I to live this declaration that Jesus is Lord? That we would declare as the psalmist, the Lord be glorified. What would it look like? What might it look like? When you say, Jesus is my master, Jesus is my boss, he's my owner, He's merciful and kind, and he lives in me. Do you would think that when you wake in the morning, Jesus lives in me, he's with me, he dwells with me. I'm not alone, I feel weak, I feel unable, but I'm protected and secure and empowered by him. That's what it would look like for you to wake up tomorrow morning and acknowledge the Lordship of Christ. Will you get up with a decision to do what God says, and you offer your life to him. You just offer your life to him. And you say, I'm going to apply his word in every situation in my life. And I'm not going to ask the question, what would Jesus do? I'm going to ask the question, what does the word of God say, and what obedience would Jesus be pleased with? And and then you would say, I want to fine-tune my heart to live for Christ by studying his word. I'm going to do it alone and with my household and with fellow believers, and I'm going to bring it to bear in my daily life and my interactions. And that you would say, I'm going to be ready to say no to myself or even other believers when they say something or want me to do something that isn't in line with the word of God. And I'm going to say, I'm not going to fear anyone's disapproval here except God's disapproval. I'm going to be ready to be rejected by those who disagree with God. And that I'm going to keep on entrusting myself to a faithful Lord in doing what is right according to him, not according to my own mind. And I'm going to say, wow, when my mind starts playing tricks on me because so many people in the world disagree with me, and they say, you must be wrong because so many people think otherwise, I'm going to go back to the objective word of God, and I'm going to use that as my rule. Jesus is my ruler. He's in control. His standard is is the unadulterated, unmixed, untwisted word of God. In Nehemiah 8, the task was tough in Nehemiah. The enemies were fierce. And you you know what was encouraged to the people of God? The joy of the Lord is your strength. Go. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Here's what happens. You believe in the lordship of Christ? You have a whole new worldview. When we talk about a Christian worldview, a biblical worldview, It's all based on the lordship of Christ, the sovereign king that transforms you with truth. He gives you a new view of life. He gives you a life where you say, well, life isn't all tragic. It's joyful in light of Christ, even in the midst of tragedy. Jesus gives me a reason to live. The lordship of Christ is your reason to wake up tomorrow morning. God has appointed you a task and gives you what you need to fill it in your home, in your office, in in the boardroom, in the the classroom, in the neighborhood. You're led by the Lord. He inspires and delights in your creative obedience. Get creative with your obedience. How can I obey him? Bring 
Bring your new world view with you. Bring it and, and bring a, a question, a godly question to bear upon the places God takes you. What difference does the living God make in all of this? What difference does Jesus Christ the Lord make in this, that this, this realm that God has given me a task in? One day there was an agnostic person who confronted Charles Spurgeon and challenged him on his Christian faith. And Spurgeon pointed to various works that flowed from Christ's obedient followers. And then he paraphrased Elijah's defiant challenge to the prophets of Baal in 1 Kings 18.20, and he said this, let the God who answers by orphanages, let him be God. You see, if you're a servant of Christ, you are not wrestling with flesh and blood, you're you're wrestling with principalities and powers. There's a spiritual battle going on for souls to be bowing and confessing Christ, but many people are, con- are bowing confessing to countless idols, acknowledging the preeminence of the wrong things. And so there's the idols of sex and money and power and prestige, and they can become your Lord if not careful. So you must always confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Uh, let me just ask you, I mean, has there been, ever been a time in your life when you could say, I was delivered by God from a near-death experience? Or has there been a time in your life when you were reconciled with a friend that you were at odds with? Or even like something mundane on a daily basis, you were able to pay your bills this month? Or, or that you were able to go to work and do your job well? Or you're able to love your family? Or, or you, you could pass a tough, tough class? Or, or you could just wake up this morning or you say, wow, I have energy to live for Jesus right now in this moment. Praise God. See, it's not due to your luck or skill or bravery. It's due to the lordship of Christ. The Lord gave you strength to do all those things. He held back the wrath against your sin. He vanquished your foes. He rescued you. And, and what you can do then because of the lordship of Christ is look forward in faith to the next deliverance. Let's say you say, but what if I get killed on the way home today? That will be a deliverance for you, believer. Because Jesus is Lord. At age 86, Polycarp, a second century bishop of Smyrna, disciple of the apostle John, he was brought to the Roman authorities and he was commanded to proclaim that Caesar is Lord. To just basically repudiate the lordship of Christ. If he did it, it would save his life. Polycarp refused to do it. He was murdered for it. Countless others have, have been in that same situation because Polycarp knew he couldn't call Caesar Lord without violating God's word. How many people have been martyred because they confessed Jesus as Lord instead of Caesar as Lord? Why do they do it? Because they knew that Jesus alone is Lord. And that was enough for them. Let's pray together. Lord, I pray that we would, would seriously have our souls captured and captivated by your sovereign authority. And we would worshipfully acknowledge your Lordship, Lord Jesus. And that we would know that you delight in yielded obedience and so we would want to, to obey with a yielded heart to bring gospel glory to you and gospel good to others as we proclaim in our hearts and our homes and to the ends of the earth that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. In whose name we pray, amen. Thanks for listening. For more information about grace, please visit our website at graceorange.org.